Good morning, everybody. Uh, holding these uh, microphones always makes me feel like a pop singer, but uh, I do my best. Um, first of all, thank you very much, show. It's uh, very nice of you to. Uh, it's very nice of you to ask me uh, uh, here on uh, this occasion, and it's always a pleasure to be at the ORF. I have uh, tremendous admiration for Jairam Ramesh. Uh, he is uh, an incisive analyst. Uh, he's a very uh, a wonderful narrator of uh, events and a terrific uh, biographer, as we've seen from his uh, previous books also. In this book, he's delivered uh, an excellent study of uh, lives and times um, between, uh, at a time when as has been mentioned, it yet it was passing through an extremely um, transitional period. And uh, he's written this in uh, what the jacket cover calls his inimitable style. And I have no particular problem with that. Uh, and I don't have a problem with the rather film starish photograph of the author, which is on the back page either. <laughs> I'd like to know who the photographer was so that we could all troop uh, to that studio. Uh, I'm overall actually to be uh, speaking uh, uh, with uh, Mr. Jawar Sarkar. He's uh, a polymath and an intellectual. And uh, as far as today is concerned, his experience of uh, uh, the contemporary civil service is much fresher than mine. And his views will therefore carry uh, much more weight. Uh, of course, uh, as uh, Ashoka has told us, this is not a discussion on the book as such. And uh, uh, Mr. Ramesh has already given a wonderful description of that book, and it's not necessary to cover that ground again. But this is a discussion on the subject uh, which is displayed behind me, um, which uh, is uh, derived from the book, but not actually the focal point of the book. And uh, it's to some extent a subject which has been discussed by the author, um, both in the book and today. Uh, Ramesh is one of our very rare politicians uh, who has some degree of respect for the civil service, and therefore that gives uh, greater credibility to his analytical skills. On a very personal note, I met uh, uh, on my very first day in the foreign service, uh, Mr. Nakba Singh, Joint Under Secretary, a PN Haksa Joint Secretary, and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, Prime Minister. So therefore, uh, three generations of the Congress Party uh, on the same day, and my first day in government. And uh, it seems really strange when I look back now, it seems like ancient history. Uh, I also followed Mr. Haksa as uh, High Commissioner in Nigeria, at uh, some three or four successors removed. I'm going to be repeatedly quoting from the book, and hence my reference to these notes. But uh, my quotations will give you a flavor, uh, I think, of what's in the book also, uh, if you haven't read it. Uh, Jehan says that Haksa was Indra's, uh, quote, ideological compass and moral beacon through her magnificent achievements in coal, bank, oil, nationalization, etc., etc., which uh, Ramesh has covered uh, more than adequately in his opening remarks. We're not here to discuss the merits or otherwise of Paksa's advice um, and Indra's subsequent actions, but whether Paksa's role was actually in conformity with that of what we associate with the civil servant. Jehan, to a great extent, encourages this kind of discussion. Uh, and uh, today, he's been much more forthright about it than in his book, where he's basically agnostic. So he writes, as has been mentioned just now, that the Naxalite movement, uh, quote, concentrated the minds of Indra Gandhi and Hatsa on agrarian distress. Between 1967 and 1973, he says, now, uh, the rich and lofty language of communiques and joint statements is not that of the leaders themselves, 
with texts prepared by officials, usually well in advance of the grand event. The one occasion, which was a Sark summit on board a boat uh, on the Meghna River in Bangladesh, uh, I found that uh, our supreme leaders were attempting to compose a text by themselves. Well, they gave it up after 10 minutes uh, and left it to their underlings. Uh, as the following rhyme will show, and now while the great ones, and now while the great ones depart to their dinner, the secretary sits, growing thinner and thinner, <laughs> as he racks his brains to record and report what they think that they think that they ought to have thought. <laughs> that pretty well sums it up. Now, Jairam assiduously mentions the occasions when Aksa and Indra disagreed, and he's mentioned those today as well, mainly the emergency and Scooters India Limited, and of course the car project, so we don't have to waste too much time on that. It's just that they did not always obviously see eye to eye. Now, but we have to remember that uh, Aksa was born with several silver spoons in his mouth. He was a member of the Kashmiri elite, very close to the Nehru's, neatly summed up by the cartoon which has been mentioned by, by Dehran. Uh, I wish we could have projected that on the screen. It's a, it's a screen, frankly. Um, and Haksa was eight when he first met Indra, and he says that, quote, she was a little child perched on the shoulder of a servant. So they both went back a very long way. And Jairam describes Aksa and Indra as, quote, sharing intimate secrets. And in London at the High Commission, where uh, Aksa was hosted, Aksa was the de facto guardian uh, to Rahi and Sunday. Now, because of these lofty connections, um, Aksa was that, quote, that rare individual whom bosses would seek out. So frankly, Haksa was not a self-made man or a typical civil servant for the five and a half years that he was secretary and then principal secretary to Indira Gandhi. So in my view, it would be completely wrong for us to draw any general conclusions from that individual's influence and standing. And as Jairam points out, the assumption that Indira functioned at the behest of Aksa is not valid. And he offers numerous quotations, uh, one particularly comes to mind, where Aksa views Indira alternately with admiration and disgust. Uh, Aksa was not a loyalist. Um, sorry, beg your pardon. Aksa was a loyalist, but not a courtier. And Indira didn't needed guidance and socialism was the zeitgeist, and they fell out uh, on Sunday and on the emergency. And as uh, Ramesh has said this morning, let's not judge Haksa by today's standards. He belonged to a completely different age. The verbose, didactic, hectoring, sanctimonious minutes that Haksa wrote, and which were uh, uh, quoted extensively in this book, would be absolutely impossible today. Uh, I think that uh, Dehram himself will remember that Rajiv Gandhi was not a reader, and he preferred midnight meetings, computer disks, and maps. Uh, P.P. Narsimha sent every note to the secretariat uh, to be summarized by people much more junior than those people who had written those notes. Now, Trump, we know, takes his views and news from pictures. Uh, Churchill preferred notes of one sentence, and his favorite reply to those notes was, action this day. So, you know, um, different leaders have different styles, but the style uh, operating during the Haksa Indira days are really long over. Now, um, nowadays, the civil servants are not supposed to entertain a strong political preferences. Uh, Dehran rather nimbly waltzes round Aksa's communist leanings. Uh, he describes him as a pragmatic socialist, not a doctrinaire ideologue. Uh, at other times, quote, unreconstructed democratic socialist, 
and then, quote, third way between the iniquities of United States-style capitalism and the loss of democracy in Soviet-style communism. These are some of the various euphemisms employed, but Huxa frankly was uh, uh, very close to the Communist Party and particularly to what you would call the CPI, CPI today. He also, um, Mr. Huxa, retained copies of what uh, Deran calls, quote, an incredible trove of secret and top secret documents of the time. I don't know whether um, Jawa has uh, any such trove, but uh, I certainly did not. And uh, Huxa also leaked information to the press, especially of the left wing variety. Now, no civil servant is supposed to do that then or now. And thankfully, Huxa did not rush into print the day that he retired, which is the norm somehow nowadays. And I just want to conclude by saying the relationship between Indira Gandhi and Huxa uh, is aptly summarized in Sharda Prasad's words. Uh, uh, Indira Gandhi was the sovereign and Huxa was the chamber. Now, Haksha is quoted as telling Mujibur Rahman in Bangladesh, uh, quote, his approach was to speak up his mind after giving such advice. It was his practice to carry out whatever instructions he received. Now, frankly, this hardly needed saying. Uh, this, was the, this is and was the code of every civil servant. In the European tradition, the civil servants are faceless and nameless and this tradition actually continues uh, alive today. Yes, except when these civil servants appear before parliamentary committees, uh, when they are seen blinking in the unaccustomed sunlight. Think tanks and the media pundits uh, in Europe would find it extremely hard to name any permanent secretary in the foreign ministry, the home ministry, or the defense ministry. And in the United States or Russia, the political undersecretary at state or the vice minister for external affairs are not names anybody knows or cares about. But in Asia, our Mandarin tradition is very strong. In China, Confucius, uh, Sun Tzu, and Li Si are still of cherished memory. And in India, the Chanakya and Birbal are still going strong. During the British Raj, uh, the government power was represented not by some distant overlord in Delhi, but by the local collector or the deputy magistrate, the, the district magistrate. And so the civil servant looms very large in our colonized mind. The media speculates on who will be the next cabinet secretary, the next culture secretary, home secretary, etc. And such persons give press conferences and assume an importance totally unrelated to their proper function. The civil servants propose, ministers dispose. Once you advise, it ceases to be your advice. And that's a formula, that's the unwritten basic formula, and I think it's a good one. As uh, Dera mentioned uh, just this morning, Hatsa was an exceptional case, and so was Pradesh Mishra. The exception should confirm the rule, civil servants should know their place, and ministers should accept their responsibilities. Thank you.